My name is Monsignor Murray Kretsch. I am a priest of the Diocese of Hamilton, and at the present time, I am the Vicar General and Chancellor for the Diocese. Today, we will study the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, called in Latin, Sacrosanctum Concilium. As we explore this document, I invite you to reflect on the place of the Church's public prayer, especially the Mass, in your own life. The first conciliar document to be issued by the bishops at the Second Vatican Council was the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. This document was promulgated on December 4, 1963, following a remarkable positive vote of the Council Fathers, 2,147 in favor and four opposed. For those who were alive at the time of the Council, this document has had a profound effect on our parish life, since, among other things, it dramatically impacted the way we celebrate the Mass. In the Latin rite of the Church, the Mass has been celebrated in the same way in every place throughout the world since the Council of Trent, which concluded in 1563. Perhaps the most striking change that the Constitution made was that the priest now would preside at an altar apart from the wall, facing the people, and Mass would be celebrated in the vernacular language rather than in Latin. In addition, the participation of all the faithful by means of hymns previously sung by choirs and responses made by altar servers was promoted as normative. For many Catholics, this change in the way we celebrated Mass was seen as a radical break with the previous 400 years. However, if one studies the history of the liturgy, it becomes clear that it was not a sudden departure from the liturgy sanctioned by the Council of Trent, but rather the result of over a century of scholarly research into the Church's public prayer and a return to the liturgical practices of the early Church. Hence, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy ushered in not so much a renovation of the liturgy, but a restoration or renewal of the Church's public prayer. For example, in 1903, Pope Pius X stated that the liturgy is the indispensable font of the true Christian spirit, in which the faithful actively participate in the public and solemn prayer of the Church. That's language that would later appear in the Second Vatican Council Constitution. In 1947, Pope Pius XII issued a first encyclical on the liturgy entitled Mediator Dei, in which he taught that the liturgy is the Church's public prayer, public celebration of the Paschal mystery of Christ's death and resurrection, through which the work of our redemption is accomplished. Well before the Second Vatican Council, reforms to the Church's liturgical discipline were underway. Limited evening masses were permitted following World War II. Revisions were made to the Holy Week liturgy in 1953 and 1956, and the Eucharistic fast was reduced. At the same time, studies were underway on the role of the Word of God in the liturgy. In the decades prior to the Second Vatican Council, pastors and scholars around the world sought to breathe new life into the Church's prayer, and renew the vitality of parish life. They called for reforms in the liturgy, which would recognize the baptismal dignity of all the faithful and their identity as a priestly people, called to offer sacrifice to God, and that would enable them to take part in the liturgy with the priest, not as silent spectators, but as active participants. With this background in mind, let us look at the Constitution. There are two parts to the document. The Constitution begins with the general principles which underline 
the proposed reforms to be made in the way we understand and the way we are called to celebrate the liturgy. Then follows some particular implications for changes to be made. The first principle enunciated in the Constitution is that the liturgy is first and foremost the action of Christ. It is quite simply the work of Christ, the Lord, in redeeming humankind and giving perfect glory to God. The liturgy is the work of Christ accomplished by the Paschal mystery of his blessed passion, resurrection from the dead, and glorious ascension, whereby dying he destroyed our death and rising he restored our life. In the waters of baptism, we die and rise with Christ. We become members of his body and share in his priestly sacrificial act of redeeming humankind and giving perfect glory to God. It is in this way, in union with Christ, never on our own, that we can say that the liturgy is what we, all the members of the Church, do. Every liturgical rite, the celebration of the Eucharist, the other sacraments, and rites such as those of marriage and funerals, are all celebrations of the once and for all saving action of Christ in which we participate. The second principle is that Christ is present in every liturgical celebration. Acknowledging that Christ is always present in the Church, the Council Fathers remind us that Christ is especially present in her liturgical celebrations. In paragraph 7 of the Constitution, the Council Fathers identify four ways that Christ, by His power, is present in the sacraments. In the Mass, in the Eucharistic species, the bread and wine transformed into the body and blood of Christ, in the sacraments, Christ is present in the person of his minister, who acts in the person of Christ. For example, when one baptizes, it is Christ himself who baptizes. In the word of God proclaimed, Christ is speaking to us. And when the church prays and sings, in the actions of the assembly, for when he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am present among them. Because of the presence and action of Christ in the sacraments, it follows that each liturgical action surpasses all other actions of the Church. The third principle is stated in paragraph 10 of the Constitution. The liturgy is described as the summit and the source of the Christian life. The liturgy is the highest form of worship that unites us most intimately with Jesus Christ in offering sacrifice to God the Father in union with the Holy Spirit. At the same time, it is the source of the true Christian spirit. All of the Church's activities, for example, care for families, outreach to the poor, education of children, care for the sick and dying, works for justice and peace, are directed to the praise of God and the salvation of the world. They are accomplished through the Paschal mystery of Christ. And in the liturgy, all the baptized find the indispensable source for the inspiration the power, the energy to carry out the saving work of Christ. The Council Fathers sought to help us understand the relationship between personal or devotional prayer and liturgical prayer. Both are important to the nurturing of our spiritual lives. So often, these two are blended together. Their distinct difference is blurred. And so in paragraph 12, the bishops remind us that our public liturgical prayer is not a time for personal devotion. Rather, it is the time for common prayer. They remind us that our communal prayer ought to flow over into our individual personal devotional prayer, and that our personal prayer and devotion should lead us always to participate fully 
in the communal prayer, which is liturgical prayer. Our participation in the liturgy is the highest form of Christian prayer. Perhaps the most well-known principle for understanding liturgical prayer is found in paragraph number 14. Here we find an echo of the vision of Pope St. Pius X. The bishops wrote, Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. They go on to say such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. Note that the Council Fathers are calling for three kinds of participation required by the very nature of the liturgy. I would like to suggest that by full is meant participation in every moment of the celebration according to our proper roles. That conscious means knowing what we are doing and why we are doing it. And active means not passive, not merely interior, but at the same time exterior, visible, auditory, and kinetic participation. Note the insistence of the Council Fathers that this participation is required by the very nature of the liturgy. It is not to be regarded as an option when we gather for liturgical prayer. Note, too, that this kind of participation is both a right and duty of every baptized person. The Constitution goes on to say, in the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered above all else, for it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful are to derive the true Christian spirit. And therefore, pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. The fifth principle I would like to identify has to do with the nature of the church. Picking up the image of the church presented in the letters of St. Paul, we are reminded that the church is made up of all the baptized, the members of the holy people of God, hierarchically ordered. Everybody is made up of the head and members. So likewise the church, which is the body of Christ. Christ is the head, and all the baptized are members of one body. The Constitution reminds us that in the liturgy, the action of the whole body of Christ, each person, minister or layperson, who has an office to perform, should do all of but only those parts which pertain to their office by the nature of the rite and the principles of the liturgy. So many of the ministries prior to the council were assumed by the priest alone, assisted by altar servers and a choir. The fathers of the council called for all the people to participate in the liturgy by means of acclamations, responses, psalmody, antiphons, songs, as well as by actions, gestures, and bodily attitudes, and at certain times by reverent silence. The sixth principle flows naturally from the fifth. The liturgy, by its nature, is communal. The Council Fathers remind us that liturgical services are not private functions, but are celebrations of the Church, which is the sacrament of unity, the holy people united and ordered under their bishops. It is good for us to remember that a sacrament is a sign but also an efficacious sign. So, in other words, the liturgy not only represents the unity of the people of God,
but it brings about this very unity. The Council Fathers go on to remind us, whenever rites, according to their specific nature, make provision for communal celebration involving the presence and active participation of the faithful, this way of celebrating them is to be preferred, so far as possible, to a celebration that is individual or quasi-private. The Council Fathers called for a restoration of the place of scripture in our liturgical rites. They sought to promote a warm and living love of scripture. They said, sacred scripture is of the greatest importance in the celebration of the liturgy, for it is from scripture that lessons are read and explained in the homily, and psalms are sung. The prayers, collects, and liturgical songs are scriptural in their inspiration and their force. And it is from the scriptures that the actions and signs derive their meaning. Later in this constitution, the Council Fathers called for a more ample proclamation of the scriptures and biblically-based preaching. They said, the treasures of the Bible are to be opened up more lavishly so that richer fare may be provided for the faithful at the table of God's word. In this way, a more representative portion of the Holy Scriptures will be read to the people in the course of a prescribed number of years. The result is our revised lectionaries and a three-year cycle of Sunday readings, including passages from the Old Testament, bishops went on to say that by means of the homily, the mysteries of the faith, and the guiding principles of the Christian life are expounded from the sacred text during the course of the liturgical year. The homily, therefore, is to be highly esteemed as part of the liturgy itself. In fact, those masses which are celebrated with the assistance of the people on Sundays and feasts of obligation it should not be omitted, except for a very serious reason. The eighth principle is noble simplicity. The Council Fathers recognized that over time, there were many additions to the liturgy. Certain ritual actions and prayers, which added to the complexity of the rite, and whose meaning had been lost to the faithful. They said, the rites should be distinguished by a noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be within people's powers of comprehension and normally should not require much explanation so that the intimate connection between the words and the rites may be apparent in the liturgy. Therefore, the bishops called for a return to noble simplicity. The ninth principle acknowledges the value of the vernacular language as a means to foster full, conscious, and active participation in the liturgy. Contrary to what many might think, the Council Fathers did not reject the use of Latin in the liturgy, a practice in the Roman Rite since the late fourth century. However, they acknowledged the value of using the vernacular or common language of the people gathered to celebrate the liturgy so that they could both understand and participate fully. This is what the bishop said. Particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. But since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the mass, the administration of the sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy frequently may be of great advantage to the people, the limits of its employment may be extended. This will apply in the first place to the readings and directives, and to some of the prayers and chants, according to the regulations on this matter to be laid down. The subsequent process which led to the almost total use of the mother tongue in all liturgical rites in the Roman church was a carefully implemented one, 
directed by the Concilium, the body entrusted by the Holy See to implement the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. It took several years and generally received a very positive reception worldwide. The final principle identified in the Constitution is enculturation. The Council Fathers called for the Church to respect and foster the genius and talents of the various races and peoples, and not to impose rigid uniformity in matters which do not implicate the faith or the good of the whole community. The Constitution provides for study of various cultural practices which are not at variance with the Christian faith and may be incorporated into the liturgy. This principle, I believe, is one that has been least developed since the Council. Determining genuine practices belonging to a cultural group and not imposing them on others who do not share that culture has resulted in a slow process of enculturation. The second part of the document speaks of actual reforms. The remainder of the Constitution outlines in detail some of the actual changes foreseen in the liturgy in keeping with the 10 principles I have just reviewed. Given the time at our disposal, I can only identify some of them to give a sense of the kind of changes that the Council Fathers identified. The Council Fathers called for changes in the order of Mass, in the rites of each of the sacraments, the Liturgy of the Hours, and the liturgical year or calendar. They called for a renewed emphasis on Sunday as the original and most important feast. With respect to music, they echoed much of what was found in Pope St. Pius X's 1903 instruction. But while upholding the importance of Gregorian chant as a valued part of the church's patrimony and asking for simpler forms to be accessible to the people, they also indicated that an, an openness to other forms of musical expression, provided that they were not offensive to the sacredness of the liturgy. Finally, they provided foundational directions for church architecture and the placement of sacred furnishings. Obviously, with the passage of 60 years since the Council, we have experienced the implementation of these changes and are aware of further changes, not immediately foreseen at the time of the Council, but changes that nevertheless are in keeping with the principles stated in the Constitution on the Liturgy. All of these, undertaken in accord with the foundational liturgical principles found in the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy.